So shame cripples us. Shame paralyzes us. Shame stops us from stepping into the fullness of God. Shame causes us to run from God as opposed to to God. So God wanted us to know Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame. chapter 3, the very last verse of Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, God created man in his image, male and female. He created them. Scripture teaches us we are not genderless. God created us in his image, male and female. In Genesis chapter 2, he created the man Adam and the woman Eve that we see. And then he says this, Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame. Doesn't say they knew no fear or they knew no doubt or they knew no joy or peace or, I mean, put in any one of the plethora of human emotions. God wanted us to know before we fell, He created us to not know what shame felt like. He created us to not know what the burden of shame would feel like. So the enemy wanting to destroy the only thing created in the image of God wanted to put on us the thing that we were never created to know what it felt like, shame, so that he could take us out, so that he could render us ineffective, so that he could render us fruitless because it is to our Father's great glory that we bear much, not a little bit, much good fruit. So shame cripples us. Shame paralyzes us. Shame stops us from stepping into the fullness of God. Shame causes us to run from God as opposed to to God. So God wanted us to know Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame. Man, I wonder what it would be like to not know what shame was like because I have no clue. There's not a time in my life or my memory that I would remember what it was like to not know any shame. I was born second generation migrant Greek in Sydney, Australia, before my big fat Greek wedding, when it was not cool to be Greek in Australia. Very, very marginalized because of my ethnicity, my gender. I grew up in a culture that did not really esteem women, certainly didn't encourage women. I grew up in the poorest zip code in my state, the third poorest zip code in the whole nation of Australia. And pretty much every week of my life for for 12 years, I was sexually abused at the hands of four men. Now that really messes with you. I never went from one stage of development to the other in any healthy way. And you know, when you first start being abused, you think what they're doing to you is wrong. But when it keeps happening, you start to believe the lie that there's something wrong with you. That's why it's happening. And I can't remember almost a time growing up where I never thought there's something wrong with me. There's something fundamentally flawed with me because see, that's what shame does. It tells you that you're not enough. You don't have to have been abused to experience shame. I mean, you could be shopping in the supermarket and the magazines will tell you you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not rich enough, you're, not, you're not just not enough. You go to school and you're just not cool enough or you're not trendy enough. We always just wish we were something a little bit more er. Uh. That's not a word, but I just said it. If I was just smarter, then maybe God could do something. If I was fitter, then maybe I could do something. If I was just a little bit richer, if I was just something errer. But then we get richer or smarter or fitter and then we're not the richest or the smartest. There's never ending. And the enemy just wants to make you feel like you'll never ever be good enough for God or you'll never ever be good enough for God to do anything with you. So we spend all our life erring or esting and never living. Some of you will get that by dessert tonight. And so what happens is this sense of I'm just not enough. And we can sit in church week after week. We can grow up in church like most of us in the South do. And fundamentally never really, really feel that God could use someone like me, that God could do anything significant with someone like me, if I was just someone different or something different, then God could. And so, shame, I'm just not enough. 
God somehow made a mistake when he made me. And so I felt like that most of my life. And then two weeks before my 33rd birthday, my brother George called me. And um, he called me to tell me that he received a, a letter from the government that said he'd been adopted. Now, you know, when you're growing up, you always tell your siblings that they're adopted. You never, ever say that we're related. You go, your mother's from Mars. But anyway, so we, but when they call you to tell you that they've been adopted, you start to think, whoa. So I said, George, they've obviously made a mistake. Call the government and then call me back. So he called me back, bawling his eyes out. He said, Chris, it's true. They told me the name of my biological mother, my biological father, when I was born, when I was immunized. I have a whole file on my life. He goes, I'm going to go tell mum. So I jump in my car, I get to my mother's house, walk in the lounge room right at the moment that my brother's giving my mum this piece of paper from the government. My mum took that piece of paper, her whole face changed. I'm like, oh my gosh, this has been a family secret for 35 years. It's true, my mum started crying. She said, George, it's true. I'm so sorry, we never thought you would find out. All of the adoptions in Australia 35 years ago, they were all closed adoptions. And before your father died, I promised him I would never tell you. So I tore up all of the paperwork and I threw it away. And church, you could imagine that moment. My brother's crying, my mother's crying, the dog's crying, you know, snot's flying, it's all kind of happening. So I'm thinking, what do you do in a moment like this? I'm Greek, so I'm going to the kitchen, I'm going to make food, it's the answer to life, the universe and everything, especially in Birmingham. And so I go, and my mum comes in and so two weeks out from my 33rd birthday, and she said, Christina, since we're telling the truth today, <laughs> some of you are with me, <laughs> do you want to know the whole truth? And I don't even know why. I turned around, I went, I've been adopted too. And with tears streaming down her face, she just nodded her head. Church, I was stunned. I, I, didn't, I didn't say anything for a few minutes, which in and of itself is a miracle greater than the resurrection of Jesus. But anyway, so after that, the very next thing, well, the very next thing I said was, am I still Greek? And I thought, because I was called a lot of names at school for a lot of years, and I wanted to know there was a reason for all of that persecution. So after that, the next thing I said to my mom, I went, oh, well, mom, before I was formed in my mother's womb, whose ever womb that was, he knew me. He knitted together my innermost parts. He fashioned all of my days before as yet there was one of them. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And church, that day, every fact that I thought to be true about my life changed. What my name was, what my background was. In fact, to this night, I don't know the facts surrounding my conception. I don't know if I was a result of a one night stand or some ongoing adulterous affair or even if I was a result of a rape, I haven't got a clue. But although I do not know the facts, I've discovered there's a force on the planet much higher than the facts, and it's called the truth of the Word of God. And my Bible does not say that I am the workmanship of a rape or an adulterous affair. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible teaches us that we are His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand in eternity that we should perform here in time. But the enemy tried to shame me. Now the fact is he will always try to shame you in the area that God most wants to use you. And so it would be just like God to take this unnamed, unwanted, abused, adopted chick from the back of Sydney, Australia that should have been a statistic and say, not only am I gonna rescue you, but now I'm gonna use you to turn around and rescue a generation of those that are trapped in slavery. That's what God would wanna do. The thing that you think has disqualified you is often the very thing that God will use to qualify you for His glory and to fulfill your purpose. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. I hope you'll share your thoughts in the comments, and if you feel led, please share this video with a friend who needs to see it. Thanks so much for watching.